So I'm going to talk about um, solidarity. And um, this really comes out of, this is a sort of on, ongoing project trying to think about the concept, uh, the idea and the experience of solidarity. Um, it, it, come, it partly comes out of, indeed, um, the, the work I've done and that uh, I've done in, in dialogue with the sources that uh, Nick was referring to and with, with Jason and his, his work in sources around the idea of the trans individual. And we sort of be, I'd sort of been thinking about this and thinking about these issues in relation to the uh, thematics of the common and thematics of democracy for several years before it occurred to me that actually what I was trying to think about was something to do with the nature of solidarity. Um, this really started when I was, I was asked to go and do a talk at, at, a, at a union occupation, at a sort of teaching at a goldsmiths when um, colleagues there were on strike a few years ago. And I, I agreed to go and do the talk. And then I was on the train over there. And, um, you know, this was uh, from, from where I live in London. And this was before, this is before Goldsmith went into its current sort of rather tragic crisis. So people there were still having a pretty nice life compared to people at my institution. I was sitting there thinking, why am I, why am I spending like several hours of my time going to give support to these fuckers? You know, they've got a better, <laughs> you know, they haven't done anything for me and my institution is falling apart. And I thought, well, solidarity, that's why you're doing it. <laughs> solidarity. So uh, not having had any ideas about what I was going to talk about, I started to make some notes about what uh, sort of the concept of solidarity involved. And it, it's, it's a schlep from my place to Goldsmith. So by the time I got there, I had a talk and and people liked it, and I've been kind of thinking about it ever since. And then when I was invited to come and be a visiting professor here in uh, 2020 for a term, I decided I would make the um, subject of the, the, the class I would teach, you know, ideas of solidarity. And again, and Tim and I thought, well, yeah, we'll put, it'll be a little class. There'll be like, you know, three or four advanced grad students might take it. That's what we should prepare for. And then it turned out there was this huge number of students, like mostly undergraduates, who really wanted to take the class because everybody, this was the, you know, the, the Bernie wave was just reaching its peak and everybody was interested in solidarity. This was a, a word that suddenly seemed to be sort of everywhere. And so, and I became sort of increasingly aware of how everywhere it was. Um, in fact, I, uh, um, the first, after I'd been here for a couple of weeks in early 2020, I, the first time I went to New York, I, I got off the, gone on the subway and I saw this sign on the um, platform. Uh, a big poster advocating, uh, alongside respect and kindness, advocating the idea of solidarity. And I remember thinking that, would, that, that would really, it would, <laughs> it would have been very difficult, it would have been difficult to imagine that happening. It certainly wouldn't happen in uh, London, but I don't think it would have, ha I'm not sure it would have happened in New York so 20 years ago. I think there's something about the, um, the resonance of the term at the moment, which is um, interesting. But why talk about the question of solidarity then at a, question, at a conference on capitalism and the human? I mean, the real reason is we thought I should do a talk and I'm not working on capitalism or the human, so I'm working on solidarity. But it's obviously, it raises very interesting questions because the, the question of solidarity, I think, has always been bound up intimately with the question of the human. And the problem of solidarity, for multiple reasons, is arguably, has arguably been the problem posed for human relations and more than human relations by the development of capitalism. The human as a concept, be it universalizing or particularizing, is always implicated in some thinking of who we are. And when the we is as capacious as possible, but not infinite, and with the question of with whom we enjoy or endure reciprocal relations. The modern language of humanism and the humanities emerges centuries before the term solidarity, but both belong to the long series of attempts to get to grips with the social and ethical consequences of the replacement of feudal agricultural societies with urban, industrial, bourgeois societies. The question of the nature, the limits, the scope and potential of human solidarity is arguably the practical, organisational and philosophical question that the experience of capitalism has posed throughout its history. Colonialism posed the question of how ethnic, historical, technological, and cultural differences between different groups of humans could be used to justify the declassification of some as fully human. Industrial modernization posed again and again the question of what forms of social solidarity could stand in for those of the village, the tribe, and clan, 
and later for the community, nation or class, as all the bonds that made them were shattered and left in the dust. Liberalism throughout its history and through its many mutations has tested the limits and forms of solidaristic norms, practices and institutions. The question of the human has often been a question of who is like us and with whom, therefore, we are enmeshed in the reciprocal relations of shared risk and responsibility for which solidarity began to be a name in the 19th century. And of course, arguably the founder of modern social theory, Emil Durkheim, you know, to, takes the question of solidarity as um, it, arguably his key question, his key object of concern. So, well, solidarity has a kind of profound, a, a, as a history, as a thematics, which is posed, is raised, is addressed almost um, necessarily by the experience of capitalist modernization. Um, and it's evoked repeatedly in both in contemporary sort of casual political discourse, but it's also evoked in a lot of, sort of theoretical and philosophical discourse. So after I sort of decided a few years ago I'm interested in sort of researching the idea of solidarity, I started collecting as many sources and references as I could. And of course in all kinds of texts, including very, very well-known texts by contemporary theorists and philosophers, you know, the, the most famous people, people like uh, Butler, you know, the term solidarity comes up a lot. It gets evoked and referred to often. But it's very rarely defined. It's very rarely specified, like, what is, what is actually meant by this term solidarity. In fact, the term usually stands for, I, I would say, acts, functions as a kind of normative placeholder. Like, it's assumed solidarity is what everybody wants and, and needs, but it's, not, it's often just not really explored. Like, what is it actually? Um, not always. Sometimes it is, although... And um, a lot of those explorations are very useful, but obviously I'm gonna, I wouldn't be wasting everybody's time if I didn't think I had something to add to it. Um, but um, before I actually bother to define what I mean by solidarity, I'm going to assume that we all have some casual sense of what it means. Think about how some of the different political traditions have understood and characterized it. Then I'll, go, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, how some of these recent thinkers have conceptualized solidarity. Uh, then finally I'll say why my account is better and why. Um, I could just give my definition of solidarity now, which would make more sense, but I like to keep people in suspense. All right, so briefly. Um, I would say that if we very, very casually, but I think usefully, you know, we can think about the, the modern political traditions as divided between the conservative, the radical, and the liberal. And each of those traditions does have its specific and distinctive attitudes to solidarity. I think it's worth keeping in mind, for example, especially when we think about solidarity as a sort of universal good that arguably the conservative tradition is one of its founding intuitions is the sense that modernity, industrialization, and liberalism weaken bonds of solidarity. They break down solidarity. And it has a solution, and its solution is essentially tradition and hierarchy. Tradition and hierarchy are good because you can't have solidarity without them, basically. That is the, one of the, fun, that is the fundamental conservative proposition, arguably. Um, and um, what Durkheim calls mechanical solidarity, from this perspective, is the only form that's ever going to really function. Conversely, the radical tradition um, is genu generally characterized by various types of universalism um, in its appeals to notions of solidarity which would go beyond the limits set by established forms of mechanical solidarity and would either be inclusive of humanity as a whole or very broad uh, collective subjectivities such as those of the organized class or those of the people um, expansively conceived. Again, Durkheim, being basically a liberal, thinks that market societies produce what he calls, you know, quite a weird use of language. He calls organic solidarity, which essentially means the, the form of the division of labor and the forms of mutual reciprocity um, which that produces, which is typical of market societies. Um, but there's a kind of agreement, I think, between Durkheim and the kind of radical tradition to the extent that the, the radical tradition does want to build upon the forms of the, what Durkheim calls organic solidarities and turn them into uh, form modes of revolutionary consciousness and revolutionary subjectivity. 
And I think arguably both the conservative and radical traditions see solidarity as, in some sense, a sort of general social fact that doesn't always really have to be explained. It's rather the absence of solidarity in particular situations that has to be explained. Solidarity, to some extent, expresses a condition of mutuality and reciprocity, which is the normal human condition. This is obviously less the case for the liberal tradition. And it's within the liberal tradition that solidarity is always more of a problem. It produces endless anxiety. It either has to be explained or it has to be explained away. Uh, and this goes back to the 17th century, to you know, the Hobbesian proposition that there is no, there is, that basically there is no natural solidarity. The evolution of contract theories, which are all basically trying to understand, really again, what Durkheim calls, solidarity on, on the basis of these imagined relationship, legalistic relationships between individuals who are conceived as fundamentally competitive with each other, fundamentally not constituted by, but entering voluntarily or involuntarily into solidaristic relations um, for the sake of advancing their individual interests. I think, now I'm, I'm talking about these issues usually from, from the perspective of somebody who who's generally doesn't, con I don't consider myself a liberal, I'm pretty, criti I'm critical of liberalism, like I'm not, I'm a kind of radical, socialistic, collectivistic critic of liberalism. But I think from that perspective, I increasingly think that it's really useful to try to make distinctions within the liberal tradition, partly just because on a basic political level, you know, in, my, in my life as a political commentator, an activist, I'm, I'm constantly making the point to comrades on the left that look, this, and this obtains here and, and in the UK, so there's about 20, 25% of the population have clearly defined socialist perspectives. So we're not in a majority. We're, not, we're only going to advance ourselves by building coalitions which are going to include some of the liberals. So part of the task of analysis is then figuring out which, which of the liberals could you possibly work with and on what basis, and which are the ones you absolutely can't. And I sort of increasingly think this is also true at the level of theory and philosophy. I mean, I think there is, there is obviously a tradition which would be manifest today or, and recently in the work of the sort of true neoliberals. And you know, in the American tradition, you'd be looking at people like the public choice theorists, and those guys are a kind of hardcore kind of liberalism that you cannot really work with. But there's also the tradition which, would in, which includes, you know, the Deweyan tradition, people like Rorty, et cetera, which would I would characterize, I mean, Rorty is a very good example. I, I would characterize as reflexive liberalism. It's a tradition which is basically liberal, but which knows that it's liberal rather than thinking of itself as some completely un unchallengeable common sense. And it also knows there are some of the problems. There are problems with the, the basic liberal claims and models, and they have to be kind of resolved. And actually, I would say, for the most part, most of the kind of philosophical and theoretical work I found in English, where people are kind of thinking about the notion of solidarity, is really coming from that tradition. I funnily, I mean, the, I haven't found that much coming out of the Marxist tradition, because when the Marxist tradition, it just tends to be sort of assumed that solidarity is an effect of class consciousness, or, or, it, or the lack of solidarity is an effect of low class consciousness. So, that, so your problem is class consciousness. The problem of solidarity isn't really a, the problem to think about. Whereas if you're a liberal, it's obviously the case. It's obviously the case we're living in a society in which the advance of things that liberals have historically say they wanted, the kind of the breaking of traditional social bonds, the pluralization of social roles, is producing all kinds of unintended consequences, uh, including the weakening of, of bonds of both traditional and modern bonds of solidarity. So you've really got to worry about it. Um, so some of the people who've written about solidarity in sort of recent decades in quite explicit terms I picked out some quotes, um, just because um, that seemed, um, at the time seemed like a good idea. Um, obviously, Richard Rorty, I think his last major book, Contingency, Irony, Solidarity, and the last chapter is called Solidarity, and he uh, makes this appeal to um, an idea of solidarity. And in this, in this kind of concluding section of this concluding book of his illustrious career as the um, last exemplar of American pragmatism, he says, uh, the view I am offering says that there is such a thing as moral progress, and that this progress is indeed in the direction of greater human solidarity. But that solidarity is not thought of as a recognition of a core self, the human essence in all human beings. Rather, it is thought of as the ability to see more and more traditional differences of tribe, religion, race, customs, and the like, as unimportant when compared with similarities with respect to pain and humiliation. 
the ability to think of people wildly different from ourselves as including in the range of us. I want to distinguish human solidarity as the identification with humanity as such and as the self-doubt which has gradually over the last few centuries been inculcated into inhabitants of the democratic states. Doubt about their own sensitivity to the pain and humiliation of others, doubt that present institutional arrangements are adequate to deal with this pain and humiliation, curiosity about possible alternatives. So that's Rorty in 89, and we can already see that, one, I mean, one of the reasons why solidarity is emerging as this term of reference is people are worrying, if, if people are basically worrying about the implications of identity politics. You know. And um, it's sort of really striking, actually, how much a lot of these debates that are going on from about 85, to, I'd say about 85 to 96, 97, are kind of, are, are being rehearsed again now in, in the debates around identity politics. Um, in 1996, Jodie Dean, I think it's her first full book, Jodie. I think it's Jodie's first full book, published a book um, very rarely referred to now. Like, I was kind of shocked. It was only when I started researching this stuff I even remembered it existed, a book in 1996 called The Solidarity of Strangers. Um, this is sort of before Jodie's sort of Zizekian Lacanian turn, when she's basically a sort of left Habermasian. So it's kind of an interesting historical um, curio now. But it's a very impressive piece of work in which she makes, in a slightly Rortian uh, vein, an impassioned case for reflective solidarity as a normative goal which can evade the limits and aporias of certain kinds of quote postmodernism and identity politics. I was about to say quote unquote postmodernism, but I realized it's me who said that. So she doesn't, she doesn't really use the term um, in the book, which is useful because it's, I think 1996 is like peak year for abuse of the term postmodernism. <laughs> like no, no one who's using the term at that point seems to have any idea of what it, what it refers to as a kind of stable concept. And at, right at the end, so, in that book, J.D. elaborates a Habermasian position that wants to both acknowledge the undecidable and complex relationality of subjectivities on all scales and somehow to um, valorize it. So towards the end of the book, she writes, far from denying the importance of our intersubjective ties in motivating and instilling solidarity, the concept I offer seeks to create a space for difference through which we can come to terms with the meaning of these ties for each and all of us. If solidarity is to move beyond the demand of unquestioning conformity, if it, if it is to escape an us-them mentality that predetermines the content of membership and character of our contribution, and if it is to take responsibility for those others always beyond our reach, it will have to be based on the communicative efforts of those who respect one another in their difference. Ultimately, reflective solidarity brings us together in a way analogous to the mutually beneficial exchange involved in the giving and receiving of a gift. In recognizing, remember when the gift was like a really trendy subject? <laughs> that just, that went absolutely nowhere. <laughs> in, recon in recognizing the difference of the other, we strengthen her self-trust and esteem. As she is valued for her own unique and irreplaceable contribution to us, she renews our bonds with one another by validating those relationships that protect the integrity of all. So, uh, one year later, uh, Donna Haraway in Modest Witness is uh, much less sentimental, I think. She writes, I am sick to death of bonding through kinship and the family, and I long for models of solidarity and human unity and difference rooted in friendship. It's time to theorize an unfamiliar unconscious, a different primal scene where everything does not stem from the dramas of identity and reproduction. Ties through blood have been bloody enough already. I believe there will be no racial or sexual peace, no livable nature until we learn to produce humanity through something more and less than kinship. So it's really about her relationship to ideas of kinship, um, but it, you know, the term solidarity crops up. So um, going into the 21st century, there's this quote, there's a quote from Sarah Ahmed, which is like all over the place because Emma Watson quoted it at some point. And Sarah says, solidarity does not assume that our struggles are the same struggles, all that our pain is the same pain, all that our hope is for the same future, uh, which I think is fine as, as, a, as a line, it's a, just that it's wrong. It, it clear, solidarity clearly does assume some of those things. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a meaningless concept frankly. And I think this is part of the problem with a certain kind of post-structuralist register 
around concepts like solidarity, concepts like friendship, concepts like democracy, as it evolves, really as it evolves um, out of, again, that moment of the mid-80s, the moment when people are reading Derrida and don't know what to do with it, and Derrida himself doesn't know what to do with it either anymore, and um, people like Leclerc and Mouffe for kind of uh, formulating their position, and everything is it's kind of negative theology. Everything is not what it is, not, not, not. And I am going to say, it's useful, it's very useful to, to it, the, that quote from Sarah does express something very useful and important about the concept of solidarity, but I think it also ultimately undercuts itself because it leaves you unable to say, well, what would actually be the stakes of, sol of solidarity? If they're, if, we, if they're not the same, if we don't have the same struggles, all the same shared interests, all the same shared future, what are we sharing? Like, what? Um, more recently, um, one of the, Juliet Hooker, uh, in 2009, makes a very powerful case that practices and conceptions of solidarity are implicitly or explicitly racialized in ways which have to be taken account of if the concept is to be effectively operationalized and without reproducing racial hierarchies. Uh, and so I particularly like um, Hooker's book, I mean, it's a very powerful argument, but also because she does actually give, she actually uh, attempts a definition of solidarity. She actually tries to say what, what it means. <laughs> Um, and she basically describes it in she describes it in terms of sort of reciprocal uh, terms of relations of reciprocity. Um, she says the concept of political solidarity, as it is generally understood, thus denotes the ability of individuals to engage in relations of trust and obligation with fellow members of a political community, whom they may see in, as inherently other in some fundamental way. In contrast to what political theorists tend to assume, however, political solidarity of this type has not existed. Instead, the norm has been racialized solidarity. Ethnic, racial, and cultural di diversity are inescapable features of contemporary political communities, and racism and racial injustice continue to shape political life within them. Solidarity is seen as arising from the geographical, social, political spaces that individuals share and as a result of which their actions have unavoidable consequences on the lives of others that also inhabit such locales. This kind of reconceptualization of the nature of political obligation is necessary in order to move beyond the racialized politics of solidarity. I've just got a couple more coming closer to the present. David Featherston, uh, the uh, Scottish political geographer writing in 2012, um, describes solidarity as a transformative political relation. And interestingly, his book is really concerned with histories of international worker solidarity and the, and the ways in which a cosmopolitan form of class consciousness was able to emerge in contexts of solidaristic struggle at various points in the 20th century. He writes, solidarity has frequently been understood as bearing primarily on the rational economic interests of workers and other groups. Such, pr such practices have also been evaluated in rather functionalist terms, such as whether they advance workers' interests in specific contexts. Solidarity here becomes theorized primarily as a means to specific ends. Locating solidarities as part of the ongoing production of relations between places and sites offers different possibilities. This challenges conceptualizations of solidarity which are limited to fixed rational relations. Rather, connections can be shaped in more emotional and intimate ways. And I thought that's a really useful quote because a lot of these attempts to get to, to say something about a, a concept of solidarity want to say solidarity is, is, some, is something ethically and aesthetically in excess of the pursuit of self-interest. Does this make, this make sense? And, um, uh, and I'm going to say that's completely wrong. It's completely the wrong direction to go in, I'm going to, say, I'm going to suggest, with conceptualizing solidarity. It's sort of, it's important to, me, to, to include those, those capacious aspects, but uh, I'll explain why when we get there. Finally, I, I couldn't really resist. It's not uh, this, um, a, little, a quote from a, a 2018 talk by Judith Butler in a tribute to Jose Esteban Munoz. Solidarity is not exactly a form of love unless we understand ambivalence as constitutive of love. It does require persistence and an openness to connection, precisely where it is not expected. We don't need to identify with one another, but we need to converge at the site of our disidentification, which I think is trying to get at something, the same kind of thing that Sarah is trying to get at in her quote, actually. 
And we can see in all of these things some really consistent themes. Firstly, solidarity is seen as having a problematic relationship with identity. Different people have different ideas in terms of what that relation of that problematic relationship is, but it's problematic. Sometimes it's evoked as a pure alternative to identity. Sometimes solidarity is the criterion according to which identities can be judged progressive and enabling or otherwise. So there's some interesting work in comparative political science, for example, which is very, is, is, is basically, uh, basically allies itself for progressive forms of nationalism in places like India and, and tries to identify, well, which kinds of political identity offer the most scope for solidarity. And, um, but that tends to be written by people who are not, uh, who are out, understandably actually, it's outside the kind of Anglo-American uh, liberal sphere, uh, where it, there tends to be more of a, a fairly stark distinction of some kind between solidaristic politics and identity politics. Another key theme is obviously, and as I said at the start, solidarity has a problematic relationship with capitalism. It destroys old solidarities, but it produces new ones, then destroys them, and so forth. Or capitalism, in the kind of Negrian line, is sort of parasitic upon existing and emergent forms of solidarity. Um, the idea of solidarity as the orienting value of any possible humanism is clearly a consistent theme in some of these sources. And then the idea of whether or not um, solidarity is about a question of interests is a kind of persistent theme about which uh, there's consistent sort of ambivalence. Now, what I'm going to suggest uh, from my point of view is, though, that the, 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 cons the persistent weakness of all of these accounts, they're all very valuable, I sort of agree with all of them, but their persistent weakness is, is their moralism. Is that in all of them, ultimately, solidarity is held up as some kind of a, an, an ethical standard, um, as something which all, an ought rather than it is, if you like. And I think this fundamentally misses the, the radical implications of the concept. For me, what is the fundamental, what is the basic definition of solidarity? It is a consciousness of shared interests. It is a consciousness that interests are sh already shared, whether you want them to be shared or not, whether it's nice that they are shared or not. It's the fact that they are. This makes sense? Now, why is this better? It's better, um, now I'm gonna say, this intro to interests is a whole other question. I haven't got time for this talk. The book I've got com we've got coming out in August, like the big, the big portmanteau theoretical chapter is our chapter on the theorization of interests. Basically the line is um, sort of post-Marxist uh, post theory and philosophy in jettisoning the concept of interest made a terrible mistake. It threw out the baby of a theory of interest with the bathwater of class essentialism and has not been able to be, and is, proved itself useless for polit political analysis That's most of the time as a consequence because you can't do political analysis without having some conception of interest. Politics is a play of interest. You can reconceptualize them. Interest absolutely do not have to be conceptualized in terms of the liberal tradition of legalistic theory, property theories. I, that, that theorists have to be, interest can be conceptualized as multiple, contradictory, overlapping and collective, but you have to have some idea of interest or you just cannot talk about politics. Um, so that's why <laughs> it's better to talk about it. But I also think that thinking about um, solidarity in terms of a problematics of shared interests allows us to address, use a, a concept of solidarity to think about issues related to the most urgent question of our times, which is obviously the climate crisis and its implications. I think and this is where we come to the question of the human, really. One of the things kind of hovering around that whole sort of sequence of ideas about solidarity that I talked about is the question of, when we're talking about the importance, the value, the, the niceness, the necessity of solidarity and solidaristic relations, are we simply talking about humanism? Are we talking about something which a, a, a philosophical or political program whose horizon would be the human, or are we talking about something that would be more than human, that would go beyond the human? And it's a fairly obvious, almost banal observation that the reality of the climate crisis brings us into a situation in which our conceptions of solidarity, of that in which, with which we are in solidarity, have to exceed the, the, the limits of the human, have to exceed the idea that we're only in solidarity with other humans. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, and I think, obviously, that's not a new thing for me to say. I mean, this is sort of what people like Haraway have been saying, but also what some of the active network people and some of the lots of kind of ecological thinkers have been saying for decades now. 
they've been evoking, I mean, Haraway with, with particular kind of poignancy and consistency, evoking an idea of a more than human solidarity, a solidarity which would, notions of solidarity which exceed the human. I think solidarity as the experience of the commonality of the common has to be understood as, from this point of view, as going beyond the human. And I also would suggest, I would sort of put this out there, but I also feel like I'm not enough of an expert on this area to really defend it, the assertion that, and this is something that got referred to yesterday, very interestingly, that um, the idea, that the kind of neo-animist idea, that how we want to express our mutual relationships with rivers or animals or gases or minerals is by giving them rights and making them all people is completely the wrong direction from this perspective. We don't, we don't want to make rivers into like property owners, the bearers of rights, like 17th century and enterers into con, you know, social contracts. That's not what we want to do with rivers. We want to be in solidarity with rivers, which is a different conception, which is about which is a way of expressing and conceptualizing our dependence on them, our mutual interdependence with them, which isn't dependent upon this logic of individualized rights and citizenship, which is a nonsense, it's a silly thing. I understand why people want to do that. I understand why, like in New Zealand, they, they regard it as an interpretation of indigenous tradition to, to give rights to rivers. I get it, and it's, I, I, I don't know enough about those traditions to know whether it's a valid interpretation of them. I have my doubts. I have my doubts that it's a valid interpretation of, of those traditions. But um, I'm not, I don't know enough to know. So, so granted, if, if I think we want to think about solidarity in terms not limited by such categories, well, uh, how do we actually do it? Well, I've already talked about this a little bit. I think we find fundamentally we have to talk, we have to think in, in terms of interests. Now, Stepping back from the question of how we relate to nature, just thinking even at the nature, at the level of political, just ordinary politics, sort of political discourse and forms of political mobilization. I think the, the uh, detaching of the idea of solidarity and the practice of solidarity from any kind of, from any kind of uh, moralism, I think is really, really crucial. Um, I remember when I was here, in early 2020, just about to start, I think it was, I think it was then, it might, it might have been a few weeks before that, but I think it was when I was just about to start teaching this class on solidarities. Uh, Bernie Sanders had this big rally in New York and there was this famous moment where he gets everyone in the room to look at their neighbor and say, say, and, say and ask themselves, are they willing to fight for this person as hard as they would fight for themselves? Very inspiring, classic expression of the socialist ideal of solidarity. And at the level of rhetoric, at that, at that moment, I wouldn't criticize it, fine, it, it was good. But at a certain conceptual level, um, it, it's completely the wrong way of framing solidarity. That actually, the, the right way to frame the idea of solidarity is not to say, you should fight for your friend as hard as you'd fight for yourself. It's to recognize that fundamentally there is no difference. That fundamentally, by fighting for your friend, you are not doing it for them because you're good, because you're like a self-sacrificing inheritor of the tradition, Christian tradition of martyrdom. It's because you fundamentally recognize that by fighting for the, the other person, even if you don't know them, you are fighting for yourself. Yeah, there is no fundamental distinction between your interests and theirs. And I think it's only at the point where left and, and progressive movements are capable of inculcating that type of consciousness in people that they have any kind of success, in my opinion. You know, we know it's absolutely, it's historically, categorically, repeatedly demonstrated to be a failure when we try and get people to do the things we want them to do because they are nice things to do, okay? It doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and there's no need for it. There's no need for it, you know, ultimately, uh, our objective is always to enable people to realize the, the sharedness, the potential collectivity of their own interests. Now, okay, even if we sort of, um, ex does that mean there's no normative dimension to solidarity at all as a concept? Uh, no, I, I, I don't really think that. I think solidarity remains a kind of interesting normative concept. I have written a book chapter, which I can't remember any of now, about the idea of an aesthetics of solidarity recently, the idea that in a lot of kind of cultural spheres, it might be solidarity might be the name for the thing which makes the experience of, of certain cultural practices exciting and enabling. And I think there's a whole interesting potential vein there. But that's a slightly different question. There still remains a question that speaks to the, the theme of the conference overall, I think, though, as to 
if, we're, if, we are, if we were to abandon the idea of the human, which Rorty, for example, evokes so eloquently in that passage, if we were to abandon that as the horizon of reference, as the sort of normative horizon of reference, then well, what, what is the normative basis for all this? Like, what is the basis upon which we think it's a good thing for people to express solidarity or to, with, with, with either from a human or a more than human perspective? Um, is it ultimately, is it ultimately always going to be a sort of humanist, a certain kind of humanism or a certain kind of biophilia which recognizes, which believes in the value of human flourishing or just the flourishing of the capacities, the creative capacities of life for their own sake? And I think the answer is yeah, probably, yeah, it's probably what it is. I don't, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> Um, this is always my, always my response to the people who declare themselves anti-vitalist. I'm, I'm like, well, what else have you got? <laughs> like, what, if, you, if vitalism isn't the basis of your ethical norms, like, what, what is? Like, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have anything better, really. I think ultimately the question of the human, if we think it through this question of the nature of our solidarities, our mutual interdependence with the non-human, the extra-human, to me always comes back to the same set of observations that, well... Um, to be truly human is always to be in a, in, a, in a productive relationship with the more than human, with the extra human. You know, there is no human which is separate from it, and uh, the, the more than human has to include the human, or it's not more than it, it's different from it, it's less than it. So, these, so, the more than, so ultimately, I think there's a sort of aporia there, annoyingly. Um, but I think also productively, that... It, that um, and to, to, to a certain extent, I tend to think the decision as to whether we, um, whether we make our appeals to the human, to the inhuman, as Catherine so usefully um, drew out, you know, suggested yesterday, or to the more than human, I think are often going to be strategic decisions based on what we're trying to achieve analytically, poetically, politically, in particular contexts. So ultimately, I think... Um, I think, I think all of these reflections, they sort of, they, I think all of these reflections converge upon a set of observations for how we think about the relation, how we think about um, the concept of solidarity in the relation of intellectual and political and aesthetic and analytical attempts to save, to, you know, to save the world, to, to, to protect and extend the capacities of both the human and the mute, more than human in the face of the depredations of capitalism. And I think what's really, ultimately, what's really critical about the way we deploy the concept of solidarity in that context is, as I've said, that solidarity, ha the idea has to be deployed in a non-moralistic sense. It doesn't necessarily mean non-normative, but a non-moralistic sense, in a sense which ultimately, which is complete, is not at all beholden to the liberal tradition and its conceptions of property and its particular conceptions of interests but which doesn't therefore jettison the idea of using the concepts of solidarity to think in terms of the, of the realization and the expansion of collective interests. Because ultimately, the only political projects which succeed are those which are able to assemble coalitions you know, of, of interests in the pursuit and furtherance and expression of those interests. So that's that.